for years, and boy was everybody excited to get back to in-person meeting. We're excited to be kicking off our residents in-person programming that's going to begin in the next month or so. And we're just excited to get back to addressing our residents many needs in our within our communities again with starting and bringing it back our 15 gardens. And with that, I'm going to turn over our meeting to Joanne Cordera, our chief um, administrative officer. Our chief of staff, I'm sorry about that. And as she kicks off today's meeting. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah and team and uh, Mark, Mike and Ed. Welcome to our little virtual chat here. Um, I'm super excited about spring and flowers and planting and gardening. And I think what a great uh, event we're going to have for our spring campaign, which Jet will get to. But uh, before that, I'm going to give you an um, introduction to our speakers. And uh, like I said, super excited to have the dialogue. So um, Mark Beal has been a licensed landscape architect for over three years and for the uh, three decades, sorry. <laughs> and for the past 22 years, the founding principal of his own landscape architectural practice, Mark Beal and Associates. Um, boy, some of these words are big. He's a horticulturalist and an avid gardener and has been a member of the Southern California Horticulture Experience as a senior garden at the LA County Arbitrum and his passion for the environment and natural systems are some of the tools he brings to the professional design approach, helping to create enduring landscapes and gardens. Oh, that was a mouthful, huh? Um, okay, through his own experience, he greatly values the, the natural world that just introduced and instill that love uh, of nature and others. Um, his landscape architect practices includes residential and educational projects, um, his, but he mostly focuses on permanent supportive affordable housing, which is right up our alley, uh, with over 50 projects in just the, the last 10 years. Uh, he's worked with many nonprofits, including Meta Housing, LA Family Housing, East LA Community Corporation, among others, and super excited that you're gonna be working with us. Um, he's a strong advocate for your client's interest and has the, has the ability to listen and build consensus between all stakeholders. Um, he also brings a practical, cost-effective approach to his designs and understands the challenges that come with maintaining and cultivating a living, breathing asset. So, Mark, welcome, welcome. I love your flower shirt. I, I put on mine, too. So. Thank you. Uh, Michael Calzada is a native Californian with roots in the South Bay and has been a resident of the neighborhood of Westport, Westchester since 1993. Uh, he attended Mira Costa High School in Manhattan Beach. Um, do you want me to say the year? I don't know. <laughs> uh, in 1973, he was selected as a senior class president by his peers. And after studying for a degree from USC School of Public Administration, Michael went on to have a successful 34 year career in civil service culminating his retirement in 2013. Wow, I'm super jealous. Um, during his career in city government, his roles included grant administrator, land use and public policy planner, and executive manager. As an executive assistant to the city manager for the city of Inglewood for eight years, Michael was responsible for the operations um, in the office regarding public service requests, media, special programs, and affecting the issuance of permits and licenses. As director of residential sound installation program for four years, he was responsible for the operation of a 30 person department with a budget over 25 million and the execution of public contracts in excess of a million. Lots of money's there. Uh, his experience includes oversight of 2 million in annual grants in the cities of Garden Grove, Orange and Inglewood, and the introduction of home improvements, the development of geographic information systems, and just a long, long list. Um, Michael began volunteering for the Emerson Avenue Community Garden Club, which led him to become a ECCE Los Angeles Master Gardener in 2015. And Michael began serving as chair of the board of directors at Emerson Avenue Community Garden in 2017. <sighs> That's a handful. Um, welcome, Michael. We're super excited to have you. Um, and we just understand we that the two of you knew each other for quite some years, so maybe we'll ask about that in a little while. Um, and Ed Givens, uh, after struggling uh, with homelessness and substance 
abuse for over 20 years. Ed Givens was welcomed home to the Skid Row Housing Trust Charles Cobb Apartments as part of the Project 50, a partnership between LA County and Skid Row Housing Trust that has identified 50 most vulnerable people living on the streets of Skid Row and provided them housing with intensive case management services. Uh, Ed has been a trust resident for 13 years and today he's thriving. Hi Ed. He is a resident champion of our Cobb Apartment Garden and we're thrilled to have him here with us today. Welcome Ed. All right, so let's get started on our panel. Um, I know uh, we have a lot of questions to get through, so I'm going to ask everyone. I'll start with you, Mark. Um, our first question, um, what inspired your passion for gardening and, um, you know, kick us off? Well, uh, I uh, grew up in rural Maryland uh, on a five acre farm, basically, that had woods and pastures and <laughs> vegetable gardens. And so I spent summers just, uh, you know, weeding and uh, planting and harvesting and weeding. Um, and, uh, you know, it 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 just sort of instilled in me this this awareness of nature and the bounty of nature. And, you know, my grandmother, my great grandmother, my mother, they all gardened. Uh, and so, you know, I was probably out there being a pest. Um, but um, then when I was older, um, I had a neighbor who had who was also an avid gardener and she would love going to nurseries so i used to tag along uh and go to nurseries and then when i moved to california i got involved with the southern california horse society and you know just even though i have a degree in business and finance uh shortly after i moved to california i completely uh switched gears uh, and uh became a landscape architect kind of just by grit. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Mike, how about you? Oh, you're on mute. There's always one. There's always one. But there I go. There you go. Tell us about yeah. your inspiration for gardening. Well, it comes uh, from a lived experience. Uh, visiting family up in Ventura County, um, wandering through citrus orchards, the the scent of citrus still it just inspires me. Um, just seeing bees buzz around, um, the light and dark of orchard, uh, the LA of cultivated uh, trees. Um, it just, uh, it, the smell of wet soil you know, uh, breaking underneath your feet. Uh, there's a lot of things in our our world that uh, give 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 me a uh, and all of us I, I think an opportunity to uh, to connect with our within ourselves um, how, how we connect with the world uh, and seeing animals um, insects all interact um, on a single blossom or uh, tree uh, throughout the seasons I uh, always uh, inspires me. Wow, that's great. I know for me, gardening is just so relaxing. You could just <laughs> blank out the world. It's so pretty. So, Ed, why don't you share with us, um, you know, how you um, are inspired by, what, how you got inspired by gardening? Oh, but actually, uh, as a young kid, I was always inspired by gardening through my mother. And uh, she used to actually keep my garden out in the back of the house. I was coming up, so I used to go out and actually help her with the garden. So I kind of, kind of you know, got inspired by the garden, by, you know, through my mother. So, you know, I used to always go out to the garden and help her. So I kind of, everything I pretty much know about gardening as of now, I pretty much know from my mother. And then as I got older, you know, I pretty much uh, went to a few classes, and I learned a lot more about the garden technique. So that's pretty much what, you know, I, I always had kind of a fascination. You know, I like to, uh, I always had a fascination with planting things because I used to like to plant flowers and so forth. I like to watch things grow. I was like a creature. 
congregation to me, you know, I like to, you know, it's like something coming alive. So that's pretty much what I'm watching my creation this fall. And uh, that's pretty much what inspired me, you know, as far as, you know, getting into God and stuff. You know, and like, you know, it's very, very relaxing, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good for the mind. Um, so I really kind of enjoy it. Thank you, Ed. I, I'm having a little bit of difficulty hearing you, so I'm, I'm hopeful everybody else is able to. But um, uh, so, yeah, let's move on to. Sorry about that. So uh, we'll move on. So, Michael, uh, here's a question for you. Uh, the missions, the mission of the Emerson uh, Avenue Community Garden Club uh, and the UCCE Los Angeles Master Gardener Program are to build a garden, grow a community, and to implement community-based educational programs that address the critical needs of the county's diverse and multi-ethnic population in the area of urban gardening, uh, which is a huge mission there. Uh, through your experience with both organizations, what have you found to be an essential when building and sustaining a successful community garden in Southern California's warmer climate and mostly urban landscape? Well, let me first say it's an honor to be here um, and not only representing Emerson Avenue Community Garden, but the master gardeners. There's some uh, 350 of us, if not more, uh, another training class is progressing through their lessons now. Um, we interact with uh, skill, school communities, uh, nonprofits, uh, neighborhoods that uh, and we end up teaching them Victory Garden lessons on how to grow their own food. Um, I think parsing out the question uh, for me uh, relies on uh, what the individual um, locale is. Each of us, um, Southern California, as you said, is being so diverse. We have uh, different environments in which we live. Um, we bring uh, to that environment uh, our own lived experiences and um, backgrounds and um, uh, whether it's shared history or uh, a love of food and the meals that we uh, learned to love as we grew up, um, we end up having to rediscover those in um, in building community. And whether that's a, a, a common shared experience or a common understanding, um, communities based on how individuals communicate and respect one another um, and in building a community uh, it it can grow as long as you uh, that community can uh, organize itself and turn itself into a sustainable organization uh, meaning that you have to respect the individual contributions the uh, ability for those pe people to if volunteer um, the individual effort becomes a, a vital resource. Um, you can't uh, continue to go to the same person all the time to do the little task uh, day in, day out. Um, you have to share the effort in in building um, and maintaining. So sustainability is really um, watching out for resources um, and then uh, making sure that the organization, um, and in this case, the community can um, sustain itself either through fundraising, um, shared experiences. We like to have uh, seed swapping at, at uh, Emerson Avenue Community Garden. Um, we grow seedlings and we uh, use those as a way to uh, have the community donate to uh, our club. Um, we share knowledge at uh, farmer's markets. Um, in the summer, we will have uh, if you will, a contest on who grows the best tomato. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, activities in the garden because we're on school property. Uh, we, um, in the, uh, our garden plots only take up one third of our almost acre piece of land. Um, most of it, because it is school property, it's publicly accessible. So we have students there during the day and the, our gardeners come in at night. So we have to respect the landowner, in this case, the school, and um, share our, the benefit of the open space. The oh, kids, kids have access on our pathways, and uh, it, it heartens me to see 
a student of special needs uh, with their caretaker, uh, just enjoying the open air, um, looking at the fluttering butterflies, uh, hearing the birds chirp, um, and then, you know, looking at flowers uh, blooming throughout the year. Wow. Um, there are other things that happen there too, um, but, you know, we will have activities um, in, uh, in May, we'll have a, a group of seniors from this senior center um, being recognized by our Rotary Club that helped us build out. So there's networking that goes on um, as in all communities, um, outreach to other organizations that help support you. Um, and you have to be able to ask for help when you need it, um, relying on others. Um, so community is, um, is as diverse as Southern California and you have to uh, respect the, the environment in which you uh, find yourself in, be it right. the or downtown. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of teamwork and uh, team building opportunities. Um, Correct. And, right. and definitely some you know, mental and, and physical health um, that you just shared, and, and that's great. I know we're going to get a little bit into that too. Um, Mark, I'm going to come to you next, right? You know, our, our spring is we have 15 uh, properties. And so, as a landscape architect, when planning out green spaces on different projects, um, there's, you know, I'm sure many variables to consider. Um, share with us what you believe are the top priorities that any landscape project um, would need and specifically what unique challenges arise when planning uh, landscapes and community gardens for affordable housing. So get into the technical stuff for us. Yeah, I was going to say it's, a, it's such a big topic. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing that I immediately bring to any project is that you know my goal is to create a landscape that thrives um, because you know it's very hard sometimes with um, development uh, teams to make them understand that it's not it's not wallpaper it's not flooring it's not furniture it's it's a living breathing natural system so you know, that's that's the one thing that I really try to emphasize. And, you know, the, the main components being, <laughs> you know, you have to have good soil. You've got to start from the ground up. And, uh, you know, on a lot of these construction projects, you, you, you know, you get what you get. But I always emphasize, you know, soil testing because, you know, even though it's uh, it is a it is a chemistry to it. You know, it sounds a little dry, but you know, it's it is a chemistry to get the right balance of nutrients and the structure of the soil. So that's where I start uh, in terms of uh, you know trying to develop a successful landscape. Um, but sometimes we import soil, um, and you know that that's another issue sometimes because. You know, your general potting soil that you get from Home Depot is really high in organics, which, you know, might be fine for flowers, uh, but it's not very sustainable for uh, for the general landscape. You know, you need you need a mix that's maybe a little bit more uh, topsoil, um, you know, or a sandy loam. So that's, you know, that's one of the things that uh, that I start with, but then you need you know, you need reliable water. Uh, you need a system that's, you know, an automatic system. Um, sometimes it's coming from domestic water, and sometimes we're required to do gray water systems in these buildings uh, where there is, um, they're collecting the laundry water uh, and putting it into uh, storage tanks. Uh, and in some cases with the city of LA, they were wanting it to be gray water ready, which is really just putting in all the infrastructure, the space for the equipment and the piping, but not actually installing the equipment um, because that is in theory going to come later. Um, you need sufficient sun. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I find with a lot of these projects is that you know, the courtyards that you find that are like within the building frame, uh, you know, are surrounded by three, four or five story floors above it. So then suddenly you're looking at just a big shade courtyard and that's not very conducive to, 
you know, especially with a community garden or an edible garden. Um, and, uh, you know, you need proper maintenance. Um, I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, in Southern California, the general um, approach uh, from most landscape maintenance companies is to do a lot of trimming. Uh, they seem to feel like trimming is what makes their job worthwhile. <laughs> um, and I try to design landscapes where you pick a plant that's appropriate for the size and space that you're putting it in so that you don't need to do so much trimming to keep it in bounds. Um, and, uh, you know, like one of the biggest problems that I find just in general with affordable housing is the density that's required, um, you know, because you have to fit the most number of units in a small, you know, within the property line, within the setbacks of the property line. So what that sometimes does is it forces all of the landscape off the ground and into, you know, courtyards and, and upper floors where they're over structure. Right. So then you're talking almost about container gardening in that situation. Mm. And that's a whole other, you know, uh, kind okay. of issue. Yeah. Um, you know, you have a lot of amenities that you have to provide uh, within a limited amount of space. You've got play structures and seating areas and barbecues and dog park, maybe, and an exercise area. And, and, and then you're also asked to put an edible garden in. <laughs> All right, and, I'm going to stop you because you're already overwhelming me. I mean, we have to worry about dirt. We have to worry about water. Right. <laughs> I know yeah. myself, I have a tiny little garden and I planted some sunflowers a couple years ago and didn't realize that they weren't the little ones. And they literally ended up being just so huge. Um, right. They were just like 12 feet tall sunflowers. So you have to definitely be prepared for how much space you have. Um, right. So those are, you know, definitely things we have to consider um how we get the water there and the dirt and i know there's so many complexities around dirt that um i think we need a chemist to probably come in and help us with that stuff but ed i want to get you back 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 on track with us here hopefully i can hear you and it wasn't it was just me but um so you know tell us about um the garden at the cob and when you moved in and what role you played or the the garden has played um in your road to wellness <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Uh, well, you know, actually, uh, I've been at the Cobbs since I came in in the uh, year 2010. And, uh, you know, I used to go up on the uh, roof and I kind of noticed how the roof was basically like empty, you know. So I kind of like came up with the idea that, you know, maybe we should, you know, put a garden up on the roof, get it started. So basically, that's where the idea came from. I kind of like, you know, but the thing was, like he was saying, as far as the resources, we really didn't have the resources until recently, maybe a couple of years later. So we had a lot of contacts from the outside. And uh, we pretty much had a, a, you know, a lot of a, a participation in far as getting the garden started. So basically, uh, when I first saw this area, it was basically just nothing but weeds. But the thing about it, the whole garden was like, like some buildings, it's like maybe a containment area or maybe one little space for a garden. The garden at the Cobbs is the entire roof. The entire roof is completely like, it's a garden. So basically, when I first went up there and looked at it, it was mostly just weeds and a lot of, you know, pebbles and sand. So we pretty much had to, you know, take care of all that. You know, we even so much as he was talking about as far as uh, the maintenance system, we actually put up an irrigation system where we put in a sprinkler system. So, you know, I would like to pretty much see the garden pretty much get back to the way it used to be, you know, so to speak, back in his heyday, you know. How do you think, mm -hmm. um, Ed, that working on the garden has helped you in your, you know, road to recovery and wellness over the years? I think it's very relaxing. You know, pretty much has uh, helped me towards my recovery. It played a big part in my recovery, but it's very relaxing. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it just eases the mind, you know, 
sometimes I come home from a hard day's you no know, work or whatever I was doing, and uh, I go up in the garden. I would spend like sometimes all day, you know, up in the garden just doing whatever I need to do. But I really enjoy it though, you know. I enjoyed uh, working in the garden like as a young kid, you know. I pretty much got started through my mother. Because, you know, coming up as a kid, she used to keep a garden in the back of our house when we was living in New York. So I pretty much used to go out and help her in the garden. And uh, that's pretty much what got me interested in gardening. So, yeah, I, I enjoy it pretty much. You know, it's, it's very relaxing. Yeah, that's great. I know, mm -hmm. just right, it just warms the soul. And when you, it, it, it feels uh, purposeful. Yeah, it, yeah it, it, it's, it's, it's very peaceful, very peaceful. Yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. purposeful watching something grow, and then of course, Mark, if you don't water it, exactly. It grow, right? <laughs> uh, okay. And not and uh, not to mention, he was talking about sunflower seeds. You know, sunflowers happen to be my favorite flower. Oh, you know, very good. I, I, I love it. You know, I uh, I plant uh, sunflowers, and uh, it's like, like I say, it's like a creation. You know, I just watch it grow. You know, it grows into something beautiful. It just grows in the sunshine. So I love when, that. I, when I see you, I'm going to show you the picture of my gigantic sunflower that, that I grew. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> all right. Forward to it. Uh, all right. Um, okay, moving down the list here. Um, so we're currently working um, on garden revitalization of 15 of our communities, and, and Jess can tell you a little bit more about that, um, and polling our residents to see what they would like to grow. Um, we understand that there is a mixture uh, you know, for flowers and food, producing um, very visually appealing. They want, you know, some good smell, you know, fragrant stuff. Um, and the results suggest that community gardens provide numerous health benefits. We've talked a little bit about that. Uh, most imp obviously improved access to nutritional food in the urban communities like Skid Row um, is considered to be food desserts. So, um, Michael, um, you, you touched a little bit more uh, on this earlier, but can you speak um, about some of the additional ecological and holistic benefits that our residents can experience through these community gardens and how you've seen firsthand the growth of community through gardening? I know you were talking about being at the school and having some of the um, kids there with special needs. So, you know, can you expand a little bit more on, you know, what our residents can look forward to as we um, build out these gardens or get them moving. Oh, you're on mute too, again. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Uh, both you and Ed, Ed touched upon this about the meditative qual qualities of, of gardening. I, I think what Ed was really ref referring to, if I might say, um, is that the the focus that it was required to tend to a garden um, helps you connect to all of your senses. Um, the se sense of smell and uh, appreciating a, a, a rose or a, a lavender gives you different sensations. Uh, if it's a mint, then you know you might have a different uh, uh, experience altogether in terms of a of, 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 of fragrance. Um, and of course, if you crush a eucalyptus leaf, you end up with a totally different experience again. The idea of seeing um, and the wonder of a, the transition of a, a worm, a caterpillar into a moth or a butterfly, it, 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 that creates a curiosity and a, um, a developing mind. But I, I think it also is intriguing as an adult seeing the beauty of a, of a butterfly, um, the colors that they all uh, differentiate themselves either as a means of protection or uh, mating um, and the, you know, the feathers of a bird uh, that come in and actually help um, manage your pests that might occur. But then you start looking at other beneficial insects, be it a lacewing, a uh, praying mantis, um, different kinds of wasps, even, even flies, that will help uh, deter um, insects that would ordinarily damage. And if, uh, everyone knows about the ladybug uh, devouring aphids. So, but the uh, ladybug larval will also uh, 
chomp down on aphids and help you protect your 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 garden. Um, so there are a lot of wonderful things that you can see, and then the tactile experience of of actually turning soil, um, managing your 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 plot or your uh, your pot um, in a container garden, pulling out uh, undesirable um, seedlings, weeds, if you want. Um, but you'll end up discovering um, uh, how your senses um, get refocused uh, within yourself and you begin to appreciate um, cultivating over a season and seeing the transformation of your labor turning into something on your plate at the end of a day or end of a season. Looking forward to a ripe squash, a ripe tomato, and, and then preparing it a meal. We all have kind of those um, experiences that we all bring to the fore. Um, wherever you grew up, it might be, um, you know, cooking uh, greens, but it could also be, you know, a tomato in a sauce or in a sandwich. Uh, if you grow beans, um, there are different expressions of a flower that come from beans, different legumes that you have, um, be it in a, a flat bread or a, 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 a unleavened piece of bread. Um, uh, a tortilla, for example, you know, is the analog to uh, a pita or um, something from from the Scandinavian countries, which is just a, just a hardened flat bread. Um, so there's different cultural expressions in, in mm -hmm. food. And I think the individuals, uh, your residents, will will uh, have a, an avenue to express themselves in the choices that they make. Um, in using the, uh, we like to say in the Master Gardeners, there's a, a, a right plant for the right space. Mm -hmm. You end up learning that um, it's you don't water the plant, you water the soil, so that uh, you end up uh, nurturing the roots and nurturing the soil as Mark referred to, because it's a microbiome biome within the soil itself. It's a living, breathing, um, beneficial um, source uh, to all gardens. And you have right. to you have to pay attention to the soil. Yeah, that soil, that dang soil, right? But isn't it just amazing? Like if you grow your own, what you know, if you're growing your own food in that little tiny, you know, strawberry that you get, it's just microscopic, but it's probably the best strawberry you've ever had because you grew right. it, even though know, it's like super tiny. <laughs> you take pride uh, in that. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, or, you know, just cutting the flowers off of the plants and putting them in your own little vase. It just, it, it, it's so much more rewarding. So, um, Mark, I'm going to go with you and then Ed, I got, I'm going to have you, you know, wrap us up here, but but Mark, you know, with your expertise, both with your hands in the soil as a senior gardener um, at the LA Arboretum uh, and longtime member of Southern California Horticulture Society, what words of advice would you give us um, as we embark on this initiative um, to revitalize our community gardens? And I, and I know it's all about the soil, but what, what else? What, what other kind of advice could you give us? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, within the confines of, of the kind of, you know, housing that we're talking about. I think that, um, you know, the, the I, I would say first and foremost, the, the developer or the nonprofit that's developing this has to be on board um, when it comes to this kind of situation. I think that, um, you know, programming and, and having people, you know, like a, a guidebook or some way of, of making this happen um, in in new developments or existing developments is really crucial because the the thing that I have experienced many times is that there was a time when funding uh, was predicated on getting points uh, and one of the point systems uh, selections was edible gardens and they would always check that box to get more points and then I sort of like be like okay okay, now what, <laughs> you know, I can put the containers there and I can put the soil there and I can get an irrigation system nearby. But, you know, a landscape architect's role is not to, you know, make it happen. We can provide all the, the tools for it, but we don't, we don't really like, you know, take it to the next level or take it to the next step. But, you know, within the, I mean, within an existing 
situation where you have the existing, um, you know, containers or areas for planting and water and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, if you're trying to renovate it and, and restore it, you know, obviously there's a lot of cleanup that needs to happen. Uh, waste, you know, you have to make decisions. Are you going to compost some of this waste or, you know, the things that you're, the plants that you have, um, you know, get the soil tested, get it, you know, find out what you're working with and, and take steps to correct it or improve the soil structure and the fertility. And, uh, and that's an ongoing thing, you know, you don't just you know, amend a soil once and walk away from it. You know, you've got to keep on doing it and keep, you know, adding nutrients to it and mulch and mulch and mulch <laughs> to it's try to help the dirt. It's all about to, the dirt. <laughs> conserving, to conserve water, you know, because uh, mulch, you know, helps create that. Uh, having a, a reliable irrigation system and and or, you know, having that, but also having the ability to hand water and, um, you know, getting people like, because I think sometimes there is a definite connection of, you know, when people actually take a watering wand and, and water plants, you know, uh, because that is an investment in, in, in making the plants grow. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you've got a backup system so that if, you know, because one, if you miss one week, you know, you could lose everything. So, um, but then, you know, I mean, Mike can probably talk about this. Then, then there are the intangibles, you know, finding a leader you know, partnering with a master gardener, at, such as Mike, <laughs> you know, inspiring people, you know, to want to participate, um, sharing the bounty that you, you know, that you've harvested so that everyone feels like they're part of it. Um, pick easy plants to start with. You know? There you go. There's a tomato, good one. Right there. Tomato <laughs> plants, you know, you can just put them in the ground and my goodness, they'll just, you know, go crazy. Um, and, and know that it's seasonal, you know, you, again, you don't just plant it once and, and you get a whole year's worth of something from it. You've got to rotate those plants in and out. You've got seasons, you've got, you know, all of that stuff to, to, uh, to contend with. So that's why I think I mentioned the idea of a guidebook. I, I, I've always had this envision in my head, even though it's not my role necessarily, is to start like, providing sort of like a, a, a roadmap, you know, on how to how to take these, you know, what I give them and how to maybe make it work, you know, on a very basic level. Yeah, just project management 101. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ed, we have just a few minutes left, so I um, want to make sure we get your thoughts here and, and, and what your hopes are for our garden revitalization project. What would you like to see out of it? You know, what's inspiring you about it? Well, I, definitely I would like to see uh garden at the Cobbs come back to life. You know, because uh, I mean, really, you know, it was, uh, I just, I just, you know, I just want to get into uh, getting the garden back started again. You know, like to see it, you know, come back to life, you know, because, and I like what he was saying about uh, the soil. That's a very big thing right there, you know, you know, the soil is basically the foundation of the whole garden. And that, that was a problem that we was having in particular with the garden when we first got the garden started. There was always a problem with the soil, but until we started getting the right type of soil into the ground and treating it and everything, it was pretty much, it made a big difference. So the soil is definitely a, a, a definite, uh, different basis about the garden you need great soil it's like a foundation it's like you build a house you have to have a firm foundation otherwise it's, it's not going to happen but uh yeah i would like to get this thing back going again you know if i could just see this happen again and i know it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of participation you know you have to have people from the outside you have to have volunteers which at one time we did have this which made it work so that would be a beautiful that would be a beautiful thing if i can see that again i would love it yeah yeah well we're, we're getting there that's uh, uh yes yeah we are definitely um mike just any final we have about a minute left but you know I'll give you about 30 seconds is there anything you know you want to share with our team about you know as we embark on this 
um, revitalization well, that, I, that we haven't talked about already? Well, I, the last exchange uh, with Mark sharing what Ed said about you know building a foundation. Um, there's a book in that, Mark, <laughs> but um, more to the point, uh, we I think we are confronted with a, re, a reduction or accessibility to resources, be it water. Um, um, some of your courtyards might not have enough sun, so you have to think creatively um, about what is uh, suitable for a particular garden. And maybe one of your sites is doing herbs while the other uh, is uh, uh, propagating the, the edible fruits because it gets four to six hours of sun. The others mm -hmm. in shade. So uh, programmatically uh, thinking about composting, um, don't have to use all the bags of soil to fill up the, the, the bins. Think of um, a lasagna building with cardboard uh, newspapers, uh, some twigs, and then um, building upon that the the topsoil that Mark um, uh, focused on earlier, um, wow. I, so okay. that you end up you, know, you end up uh, creating a, a bottom layer of compost compostable material, and then as you start uh, propagating and taking <laughs> off the the cuttings that you don't want to eat, though you could argue that most anything the green you can eat like the tops of carrots and radishes and things for salads and you know you wrinkle your nose but you know <laughs> they 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 do have nutritional value so what you end up doing um is you know you create a pesto out of that those carrot tops um you can uh have those discards of greens and you mix them back into your your uh pot as a uh, compost and so you, you don't have to keep replenishing with just topsoil you're right. you're you're uh, regenerating your soil with the nutrients that you've grown yourself wow yeah that's all very interesting um so uh jet i know we're just right about the time do we have some questions we want to take you're on mute <laughs> we do have this joanne Thank you. Um, Mark and Mike, thank you so much for being here. And Ed, it is always so good to see you. Um, and Joe, congratulations. This is Joe's first virtual community meeting. Um, she is moderating and she did a fantastic job. So the Seeds of Hope campaign um, is tremendously important to Ed and to all of our residents and to so many of our team members. Um, Ed's case manager and uh, the case manager at the Star and the longtime property manager at the New Harbor were really the inspiration for this campaign. And we are working on making sure that all of our um, communities have a team of people who are invested in the gardens, including a corporate sponsor and a leadership champion and a site champion and a resident champion and a board member champion. Um, and then we're very motivated and excited to uh, to experts like Mike and Mark uh, and you know others in the gardening community to help advise us and and lead this forward and make these really more sustainable. Um, so with that, Mike Alvidris asked a question that I think has actually been answered. Um, but he was looking um, for some of the specific benefits that. Um, Mike and Mark might have to share about research that's been done on the positive effects and benefits of gardens in terms of creating a sense of well-being in people who experience gardens and or gardening. And I think this gets into some of the focus and meditation um, type of conversation you were having. Does anyone want to expand on that? Mark, are Mark, you are with research? research? I'm sorry, I was getting an echo. What? Well, uh, I, uh, we, know, I, we know. I'm not sure. Not sure. Oh, I just turned on my mic. Is it, you getting a reverb? Anyone? Now it stopped. OK, I, I, I asked Mark if he knew of any research, but I, I, I know that there are some. Um, scientific journals that uh, talk about uh, the Japanese experience of foresting 
going out and requiring people to walk it within force for uh, for their work breaks or um, their own mental well-being. The same can be said about you know walking in a park. That's what we try to do with our uh, community garden, having fifty percent of the land being um, non um, propagating, but we do have a, a more than our share of fruit um, fruit trees. Uh, we're creating a Zen uh, garden, a place where people could actually meditate there. We have a circle. We do uh, readings for kids there as well. But the interaction of um, of people within a, a calm space, I think, is beneficial. The hustle and bustle of city life can can be wearing. Um, um, and even though we live less than you know 20 feet away from our neighbors and some residential areas or in apartments down the hallway. Um, we live in that cocoon, be it in our cars or in our apartments and being outside, just being in, enjoying sunshine, fresh air um, are, are intangibles, but I think it uh, provides a great deal of value to our, uh, our life. Um, and then if you get to be a gardener or, you know, plant on your balcony or, you know, become a community gardener mem member, um, you interact um, not only within your plot, but with your other uh, gardeners that have a shared experience. So there's, a, I think, a great deal to be said about um, reconnecting to a, the, our natural ecological systems that Mark talked about earlier. Yeah, I, I just real quickly, I just wanted to add that, you know, when I grew up, you know, in Maryland, you know, we were surrounded by woods and nature. And when I moved to California, especially LA, you know, I, I just found that all the school campuses were, you know, surrounded by fences and barbed wire. And I got involved with tree people early on. And, uh, you know, even as I developed my practice, I, I just made it a real focus to try to, even, even if you just planted a grove of trees somewhere, that was just enough that you could walk into it and be surrounded by trees. That was that was you know. I always felt like if if you could just do that, <laughs> you know, that you could really change a person's perception, you know, of what it means to be in nature, you know, in an urban school campus kind of setting. Is there another question? There is another question. The next question comes from Tiffany, and she is interested in knowing, um, you know, what you have to say about the effects of gardening on food insecurity in historically under-resourced communities. I, I know that um, many of our uh, master gardeners are involved with uh, Food Forward, for example. Um, they organize. Uh, uh, surplus produce and redistribute it of uh, that those um, uh, fruit and vegetables to food pantries in, the, um, in a particular area. Um, they organize also collections for different neighborhoods. Um, I'm hoping that our community garden can be uh, successful in growing um, now that we're have come out of uh, pandemic protocols that our some of our surplus um, food could be also donated to uh, food pantries. Um, we all uh, helped or assisted, collaborated with the um, Otis Art Institute, which is in our neighborhood. Um, and some of their students actually um, collected our surplus produce for, for their students. Um, food insecurity is a, um, such a, a pressing need I think an exorbitant number of students in the school district, LA Unified, um, either don't have a healthy breakfast, um, don't have um, the means to buy, you know, a, a, a nutritious lunch and um, go home and not to uh, plentiful meals. So there's a great deal of insecurity within our younger populations. Um, part of our garden actually has a um, area devoted to um, our first to fifth graders and each class has their own little plot 
to um, grow their own food. Um, we have our challenges of, of rodents at the in the meantime, but uh, we're overcoming that hurdle. Um, it, we hope that there's more collaboration between us and the school um, and the teachers involved to actually have um, an academic portion devoted to, to horticultural and or gardening. Um, I know that we end up sponsoring um, a, a food festival for them and we uh, supply some extra um, produce for their their shared lunch. So, um, our, our a 300 square foot garden produces hundreds of pounds of food. Um, and I know that our gardeners are uh, supplementing their their food budgets and sharing um, their produce with friends and family. So it it, it helps some and it will help uh, the economics of a, a household. We are right at the top of the hour and there are a couple of more questions, but I'd like to be respectful of your time as well. We're so grateful for your sharing your expertise here with us today. Um, are you available to take a couple more questions? Sure. I am. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much. And um, well then, uh, Maura asks, what in your experience has been the most impactful planting in terms of helping residents? such as um, edible landscaping of rosemary, thyme, parsley, sage, and trees like bay trees, lemons, limes, et cetera. Do you find that works uh, well with resident planted garden beds? So the, I think that that's probably a good one for uh, you, Mark. Yeah, well, I, I was just gonna say that I think that in, in many cases when, when we are given uh, the opportunity to provide space for edible gardens, that without necessarily having an understanding, and you'd be surprised how hard it is to get an answer out of out of uh, some of the developers. Um, you know, if if there's not a specific commitment to having like an actual program for for community gardens, uh, most of the time I will provide uh, a couple of citrus trees. Uh, to you know, to give lemons or oranges or limes if there's space, um, and herbs. Um, you know, because herbs are m well, most herbs are more perennial, rosemary, oregano, um, and that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes I'll toss in some parsley and and uh, cilantro and and so forth. And and with the understanding that you know that those things are not permanent so you've got to replace them periodically but I try to you know I can't plant tomatoes and I can't plant lettuce and I can't plant any of that stuff at the beginning because I don't know if I have if, if anyone's going to pay attention to it um, uh, because you know the process of designing and, and having buildings built is coming way before um, you know the asset management team gets involved and and that sort of thing. So I don't always get to work beyond that installation. Um, you know, once it's in, uh, you know, I, they don't they don't necessarily want me around. <laughs> I try to stick my nose in periodically, but uh, you know, well, that's it's just a challenge. But yeah, that's what I do work mostly with herbs and fruit trees. Thanks for that. Um, uh, there's actually three more questions, and so I want to make sure that you know we get through these as quickly as possible. Monica asks, um, "Are there what resources uh, would you recommend to us for grants or other funding as we embark on this initiative?" And Mark, you had touched on this earlier. You know, as the communities are developed and the garden is part of the initial plan or the scoring process, you know, we. We have 15 of them now and, and and don't have ongoing sources of sustainable funding. And that's part of what we're working on um, developing this year as well. Well, I don't really get involved with funding on that level. Um, you know, that that's that's up to the development team, um, you know, and the developer and the nonprofit. Um, you know, I'm I'm trying to give them the best landscape that I can give them. Um, and beyond that, 
you know, I don't really get involved in, in those things, but I know that, you know, there are numerous, I mean, Mike can probably speak much more to this than I can in terms of, you know, where, where you can get sources of funding. Mike, what are your recommendations? Uh, if I may, I, we have experience at the community garden. We actually uh, were able to get some donated um, time from a, a grant writer. Um, and it, he was not necessarily successful in in parlaying um, a, his developing network for us, but he did make a connection with a local white knight. And that white knight was uh, the Rotary Club. And they ended up supporting us with their funds um, in helping us build out and installing um, sidewalks within our our um, our garden. And the transformation is is wonderful. We're no, no longer uh, applying mulch um, at hundreds of cubic feet a year. Um, no longer pulling weeds, and we have a really nice looking um, garden like setting. Um, a garden. I mean, it, it's it. We still have the 300 square foot uh, plots for, by 39 uh, gardeners, but um, it, it's a wonderful experience now. Uh, in terms of fundraising, we do a lot of fundraising uh, from pancake breakfast to um, uh, fundraising through uh, auctions and raffles and things of that sort. Accumulating accumulating that over a 10 year period helped us underwrite some of our capital costs for the build out. Um, there are uh, commercial enterprises that will donate things like topsoil. And, you know, I, offline I'll probably share with you my contact, <laughs> but there are <laughs> there are some, some um, groups that will do that. As a master gardener, I cannot promote an individual business, but there are ways for us to you know, Carlay, um, you know, just making the ask, you never know if they're going to be able to help or not, but you have um, legitimacy, I think, in service and your, um, the 15 locations that you have. So there's, uh, I think, a, a, a bit of scale that you can parlay into a, a larger ask. Thank you. Um, we will be following up with you offline, uh, and we, you know, are deeply invested in this in our, our residents and team members and communities. So we're looking forward to connecting to those resources. Um, Ed, the next question is for you as the resident champion for the Charles Cobb Community Garden. What's the first thing you personally would like to plant? Well, I must say, definitely sunflowers. <laughs> that's, that that's that's my favorite uh, flower. You know, it would definitely be sunflowers. You know, but yeah, I, like I said, I would like to you know get the uh, garden back going and yeah, you know, definitely plant strawberries. You know, but I would like to really see that happen again. You know, I really enjoy I would really enjoy seeing it again. You know, if it's possible, like I said, the biggest thing would be the participation. You have to have participation, you know, because uh, it's not a one-man job. So I would like to see it happen again, definitely. Thank you for that. And this last question, I think, is probably a good one to just do a round robin and end on. Nedra would like to know uh, what is the best fruit, veg, and herbs to grow for beginners? Ed, I'll start with you, and then we can go uh, to Mark and to Mike. I would say keep it simple. You know, let's keep it simple. Anything like, you know, so much as like a, a, a vegetable, you know, a, a strawberries, you know, a, a tomatoes, you know, anything simple, you know. Uh, you know, no matter what it may be. It could be, uh, you know, uh, onions, whatever, you know. Just keep it simple, you know, and let's go from there. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of sun, uh, I love artichokes. Uh, sculpturally, they're really great leaves. Um, and uh, set it and forget it, because you it, it it'll it'll my artichokes that get a lot of sun um, end up sending out new plants every year. Uh, even you know you're cutting off their flower, and that plant eventually dies. 
Um, oh, it's, it's been yeah. giving for like three years, but as a, a, a herb garden, um, time works really well. Um, I, I, you know, there's so many simple things to, to grow. Um, carrots sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I, I, and, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I just want to say, I just want to add to what you just said, you know, as far as uh, we act, I actually planted an artichoke and uh, it does require a lot of sunshine, a lot of, yep. definitely a lot of sunshine. You know, you have to treat it, you know, you have to tend to it, but sunshine, sunshine is definitely a must. So yes, you know. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, I, my vote would always be for tomatoes. Um, Growing up on, in Maryland, tomatoes were like the summer delicacy. And so even on my seventh floor, six foot by 25 foot, you know, terrace, um, I have tomato plants. I always grow tomato plants um, and they're pretty easy to do. Um, rosemary is so easy to grow and, um, you know, peppers you can grow fairly easily. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I always say that with gardening that, um, you know, be, be okay with making mistakes and learn from them <laughs> because in the end, you know, you'll be a better gardener. Um, don't worry about failure. It's just a learning tool. <laughs> what a fantastic note to end on. Um, <laughs> Ed and Mike and Mark and Joanne, thank you so much for today's conversation. It was really great to see the engagement level across the audience and, and we're very, very grateful for your expertise and your commitment um, as we embark on this journey to restore our community gardens. And with that, we hope to see everybody again next month. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for having thank us. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Really thank you. Bye. Bye.